Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Mark Hamrick. I'm a broadcast journalist for the Associated Press. I'm the 104th president of the National Press Club. We are the world's leading organization for journalists, committed to our profession's future through our programming, events such as this, while also working to foster a free press around the world. For more information about the National Press Club, please visit our website at www.press.org. To donate to programs offered to the public through our Eric Friedheim National Journalism Library, you can find information on the website there as well. So on behalf of our members worldwide, I'd like to welcome our speaker and those of our, you attending today's event. Our head table includes working journalists as well as guests of the speaker, uh, working journalists who are club members. If you hear applause in our audience, we'd like to note that members of the general public are attending here today, so it's not necessarily evidence of a lack of journalistic objectivity. I'd also like to welcome our C-SPAN and public radio audiences. Our luncheons are also featured on our member-produced weekly podcast from the National Press Club, available through iTunes. You can also follow the action on Twitter using the hashtag, uh, using the, uh, using the uh, search term hashtag NPC lunch. After our guest speech concludes, we'll have a Q&A, and I'll ask as many questions as time permits. And now it's time to introduce our head table guests. I'd ask each of you here to please stand up briefly as your name is announced. So from your right, Mark Ramondi with Harris Corporation, NPC member, director of communications there. John Fales, a columnist with the Washington Times. Myron Belkind is our club secretary, and he is adjunct uh, professor with George Washington University, former Associated Press Bureau Chief in London, Tokyo, and New Delhi. Lee Perryman with the Associated Press. He is Director of Broadcast Technology. <coughs> Mrs. Diane Jones, wife of General James Jones, our guest speaker today. Now uh, moving over the podium, Melissa Charbonneau with Newshook Media, and she is the awesome chair of our speakers committee. Skip over the speaker for a moment. Pat Milton, investigative producer with CBS News, and uh, she's a new member of the Speakers Committee. This is her first event today, and she organized today's event. Pat, thank you very much. Buzz Hefty is vice president of Van Skoyak Associates, and he is a guest of the speaker. Andrea Stone, senior national correspondent with the Huffington Post. John Donnelly. Senior writer with Congressional Quarterly covering defense and foreign policy issues, and he is vice chair of our Board of Governors. And Shannon O'Reilly, a new member of the National Press Club. She is with the Center for a New American Security. Please give them a round of applause. Our guest speaker today is a man who has spent his life facing the most critical challenges one can imagine and handling them with grace and a steady hand. Those who know him point to his intelligence, his integrity, his calmness, his confidence, and believe it or not, his sense of humor. At six foot four, he played basketball for the Georgetown Hoyas in college and probably could have pursued a sports career. But he chose to follow in the footsteps of his father and his uncle and join the Marine Corps and he had big shoes to fill. His father retired as a major, and in World War II, he was the first commander of Marine Corps Force Reconnaissance, that's the Marine version of Navy SEALs. All three, father, son, and uncle, ended up serving in Vietnam at the same time in the late 1960s. After the war, he was faced with a crucial decision. If he was going to have a career in the military, he would have to follow orders to Japan. And that meant leaving his wife and four children, under the age of six, behind for more than a year. That would be a huge burden for the family, but like most decisions in his life, he had married well too. His wife Diane took on that responsibility, and he would be forever grateful, and so is the nation. Not everybody who works hard and pursues his dream ends up as Commandant of the U.S. Marine Corps, and then Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, and then is chosen to be the U.S. National security advisor to the President of the United States, President Barack Obama, but there is only one General James Jones. General Jones has served his country selflessly and with distinction and unknown to most people. General Jones many times used to ride his bicycle to work at the White House. That meant a pre-dawn 14 mile long trip from his suburban Washington home depending on the route chosen that day by his security detail. He speaks fluent French, He's a big fan of country music star Toby Keith. 
fact, he had Keith perform for the Marines in Washington where he urged him for the first time to sing his now famous hit, Angry American. Since leaving government and military service, our guest speaker has turned his focus to launching a consulting company, Jones Group International, and there he is confronting 21st century, 21st century national security issues to improve U.S. economic competitiveness and to develop a comprehensive energy strategy. Of course, his areas of expertise are relevant to affairs of life and death, the most critical decisions that rise to the highest levels of government. And that's why we're so pleased to have him as our guest speaker today. Please give a warm National Press Club welcome to General James Jones. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, and, and uh, it's a great honor to be here, and I, I want to compliment you on your choice of weapons. Uh, uh, this is uh, very impressive, and Marines like knives, and so depending on how aggressive the questions get, uh, be forewarned, uh, we are we're defending the podium. I, uh, I am uh, thrilled to be here, uh, I, uh, and I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, I want to especially thank Pat Milton for, for her hard work in uh, bringing this together. Um, I've been asked to speak on uh, the strategic implications of current and continuing developments in the greater Middle East, and fortunately we have plenty of time to cover a subject like that, 20 minutes, um, which should be more than adequate to uh, be completely superfluous in anything we talk about. Um, but for those uh, who thought that uh, the Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts uh, were representative of how the, the 21st century was going to announce itself in terms of uh, the type of conflicts that w we would face. Uh, we've really uh, found out quite recently just how wrong that thinking was. Um, the rapidly changing strategic landscape, especially during the last few months, tells us uh, that while it is very, very difficult to uh, accurately predict the future, it uh, underscores how crucial it is that we do our very best to assess the strategic impl implications of recent events and to not be distracted from the historical potential of what superficially appears to be similar, but which in reality are very diverse uh, series of events. And while all of these events in North Africa and in the Middle East share some linkage, all are quite different and all retain their own unique character. I actually feel very sorry for my successor and, and the staff at the National Security Council for the amount of uh, for the influx in the number of uh, issues that have just uh, surfaced just in the last few months. And uh, we owe them a, a great uh, debt of thanks in the way they manage uh, these things so capably. But it seems to me that what uh, the recent events uh, have in common is the awakening of an entire generation of young people in, in many countries. Uh, young people who have come to the realization uh, almost at the same time that absent major reforms in uh, the way they are currently governed, their future and that of their children uh, holds a little promise for them. They are aware, perhaps as never before, of the options that are available to people elsewhere in the world. And this awareness comes from a, a diverse number of sources. It comes from uh, travel, it comes from the internet, it comes from the fact that some have been educated uh, abroad in different countries comes from word of mouth. Whatever the source um, of this new awareness, it is powerful enough to change the course of history and to do so extremely rapidly. What we're witnessing uh, in the Middle East and in the North African literal in particular is perhaps the most significant historical event uh, since the end of the Cold War. While some people claim that they knew that these social tremors were developing in several countries, uh, no one could have predicted with any accuracy the spark that would cause the eruption of, of so many people almost simultaneously. One thing is sure, even if this awakening movement uh, stopped tomorrow, and it won't, uh, even the most oppressive regimes on the planet have been put on notice. And while this is generally a good thing, it does present some special challenges for the United States and its leadership, not only in the region, but in the world. 
So the phenomenon of the events that are unfolding in North Africa uh, for the past uh, few months has relegated the traditional headline grabbers to lesser positions in our collective attention. Iran's nuclear project, uh, a, a hot topic for 2009 and most of 2010, the Middle East peace process, our own national disengagement of combat troops in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, and other important events have taken temporarily perhaps, but a lesser place with regard to our daily focus. But all of these remain as critically important as ever before, perhaps even more so. In Iran, for example, a country which still casts its menacing shadow over the entire region, in attention to the fact that just over 30 years ago, the fall of the Shah of Iran was supposed to lead to a more open Iranian society, but yielded just the opposite. We can be sure that the now temporarily quieter Iran is working extremely hard uh, to ensure that the new Tunisia, the new Egypt, the survival of President Assad in Syria, the outcomes of the serious uncertainties in Yemen and Libya, the continuing failure to restart the Middle East peace talks between Israelis and Palestinians and the so-called reconciliation of Hamas and Fatah all come out the way that they want. Um, at the same time, the regime has continued its nuclear program unimpeded by global condemnation and so far by the sanctions that have been applied by the global community. That we can be sure that this regime has to be paying close attention to the popular movements going on around it, especially in Syria, where another oppressive regime is experiencing a popular challenge to its legitimacy to lead the nation. And as we watch the brutality of events unfold in Syria, we should be mindful of the strategic consequences of any solution to the current challenges to that government. Lebanon and Jordan both merit different but special attentions in this regard as well. The Middle East peace process, perhaps the longest running major global issue of our time, the one that most people who have studied the problem and its history know with near certainty what the ultimate resolution will look like. It's just that no one is willing to take the first step in the process required to get there. How tragic. This is, not, um, this is not to say that uh, it is un unsolvable or unresolvable, but it is to say the time is not on any one side. In fact, the inability to make even the smallest progress is hurtful to both sides and perpetuates an issue that affects not only the region, but a large part of the world. For the past few years, Americans, Arabs, and Europeans, to include Russia, have largely been in agreement with regard to what must happen in order to establish a Palestinian state and to satisfy Israel's legitimate concerns for its own security. But it hasn't happened yet. Senator George Mitchell's departure from the scene after a Herculean effort, for which our nation should be grateful, is not an indication that peace is at hand. And Iran is quite content with this development and this situation. The implications of a Fatah-Hamas reconciliation need further analysis, but initial signs are that this may not be helpful to the process either. Nearby in Iraq, the current flirtations of the Iraqi government with Iran is not exactly what we had in mind when the new Iraqi sovereignty was restored in 2009. Yet just a few weeks ago, on the 8th of April, uniformed Iraqi troops launched an unprovoked attack on a camp where several thousand Iranian expatriates opposed to the current reg Iranian regime had lived for many years. This attack on unarmed people, which U.S. forces protected from 2003 to 2009, resulted in 35 dead and over 200 wounded, including women and children. The evidence of collusion between Iraq and Iran to initiate this attack is strong, so the questions that should be asked of ourselves are becoming clearer as we withdraw our combat forces from Iraq. What have we really created in Iraq, and what will we have to show for the enormity of our sacrifice in the years ahead? In Egypt, when we look at strategically important countries, Egypt commands a unique regional position, and it is extremely important that Egypt not turn out the way Iran did 30 years ago. Fortunately, thus far at least, the Egyptian army has shown itself worthy of the trust of the Egyptian people as they move towards September elections. On this point, it is worth thinking about how the United States will relate to the new Egyptian government. From my perspective, 
it may be time to consider a bold idea which would demonstrate our welcome um, to the new Egypt by considering a type of Marshall Plan for emerging democratic states like Egypt uh, and, and young Egyptians uh, are trying to form. Such a plan would be international in scope uh, as the world has much to gain from any security, economic, and governmental assistance that can be provided at this critical time in Egypt's history. It would also send a clear message to people who currently may doubt our intentions and it will limit the effort of radical elements who obviously want to create a totally different world, one country at a time. Egypt, of course, is foremost in their thoughts. So Egypt and what happens there in the near future um, is very much uh, an inflection point that we should pay attention to. While we should, uh, uh, with regard to Libya, while we should applaud um, the speed with which the United Nations and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and to a certain extent the Arab League and the African Union responded to the humanitarian issue and by uh, obtaining a mandate to protect civilians through the imposition of the no-fly zone and the uh, naval blockade, it does appear that the Gaddafi uh, regime is fairly well entrenched and willing to take a long view with regard to this struggle. Um, strategically for the United States, Libya is not on par with Egypt in terms of vital interest, but how this crisis is resolved and when it is resolved is of great importance uh, to us, uh, to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, whose success, um, despite a quite limited mandate, will ultimately be evaluated against the regime's survival or its collapse. That may be unfortunate, but it happens to be reality. The crisis in which um, the U.S. plays a supportive role will also be influenced uh, in large part by, um, by the Arab League and the African Union, whose early voices have been more forceful than expected, and hopefully this will continue. Uh, certainly European interest in the outcome uh, of uh, this uh, Libyan uh, situation uh, is very, very uh, important and for good reason. In Afghanistan, and, and by necessary association, Pakistan, 2014 is now the year where President Karzai will get his wish to have full control of his nation's security, economy, and governance by that year. The path to that end will start this year in the withdrawal of some of our forces, and you can be sure some of our allies' forces, uh, is underway. This is encouraging, uh, as the plan for transferring to Afghans control of each province one at a time as security, governance, and economic measures take hold is, is, is something that uh, we've worked on for quite a while. This massive effort, which has taken its toll in many countries uh, and at great cost, has come to the point that we cannot want for the hap Afghans that which they either do not want for themselves or are unwilling to fight for themselves in order to bring peace and a better way of life to that country. This was true in South Vietnam, as I discovered as a young 23-year-old second lieutenant, and it is true in Afghanistan. Their future destiny beyond 2014 will be up to them, just as President Karzai demanded at the London conference. They will have the means to chart their own destiny, and time will tell if they have the will. A word or two on Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan and the fate of Osama bin Laden uh, are intertwined in the ultimate outcome for Afghanistan and the entire region. Bin Laden's fate and the fate of the majority of Al Qaeda's leadership over the past few years over the past few years should serve as a clear warning to those who would lead such movements in the future. Like no one since perhaps Hitler uh, and Stalin, bin Laden unified much of the world against his type of threat. The result is now clear. The world is safer because of the astounding progress made by the cohesion of operational and intelligence assets of many of our governments who see this menace as an attack against us all. This is a major achievement which should not be um, ignored where human technological and the need for rapid decision making now permits us to be more confident that Osama bin Laden and others like him will fail. The fallout with Pakistan over the discovery of bin Laden's now uh, operational headquarters near Islamabad 
will have important and perhaps long-lasting consequences. Pakistan has thus far resisted the offer of a long-term strategic relationship with the United States and other countries, which would help bring a better life for its citizens and a more peaceful region to, the, to its east and to its west. While Pakistan should be given credit for some incremental progress in rooting out some terrorists within their borders, notably in the Swat Valley and South Waziristan, uh, which were both successful military interventions. The undeniable fact is that since their deeply flawed decision uh, to not put their army along the border with Afghanistan um, in this in 2006, thinking that the tribes would, in, in exchange for the army not being present, um, would patrol um, the border and prevent illegal crossings. Pakistan has become uh, a selective safe haven for terrorists and, and terrorist leaders. And this fact alone has resulted in prolonging the efforts in Afghanistan and continues to cause us and our allies to suffer many more casualties and to deplete our national treasure at a time when obviously we can ill afford to do so. Like Egypt, though, the strategic importance of Pakistan cannot be overstated. And despite the current tensions between our countries over the bin Laden incident um, and with regard to safe havens, um, it is time uh, to consider the possibilities uh, that we can ensure that the conclusion to the hunt for bin Laden will become a starting point for a renewed effort to find the common ground on issues uh, that we should all care about and that affect our national, our collective security and our future hopes for regional peace, which will be to the betterment of Pakistan and its people and to the betterment of its neighbors on either side. Failure to capitalize in a positive way on this strategic moment would be a mistake of significant proportions. So ladies and gentlemen, the pace and the importance of global events we witness each day is astounding. These events are forcing strategic decisions to be made at a more rapid pace than ever before. We will clearly need an increasingly more proactive engagement strategy uh, to prevent future conflicts and to meet the challenges of our smaller in terms of speed of, of activity, but more globalized world. The 21st century requires that we rethink the 20th century concepts of how we deal with the tectonic changes to the global landscape. American leadership and the ability to form appropriate um, and timely solution sets to the enormous diversity of global challenges will continue to be necessary, perhaps as never before. I'm very optimistic that this can be done. In times of crisis, America has always found the solution to its most serious and threatening challenges. May it always be so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll begin with the questions uh, coming from our audience. And you know, obviously, Osama bin Laden being seeming to be the most uh, pressing news story of, of the past several weeks. It's sort of that's uh, the area where we begin. And on the question of Pakistan, uh, how can the United States get Pakistan to be a more reliable partner? You talked about trying to make a renewed effort, but how do you get that going? The carrots and sticks, mostly carrots approach, haven't worked much so far. Well, this is um, a, a puzzling um, fact. Um, I know that um, President Obama um, and the, our entire National Security Council staff and the State Department and Secretary Gates, uh, CIA, the whole structure of our, of our government has been involved in uh, working to try to overcome the, um, uh, the, the, the hurdles that are in, in this relationship. Um, one of the things that um, it's important to try to do when you deal with complex issues like this is try to understand how the other guy on the other side is looking at the same set of problems. Uh, and, um, and while we have made some progress, uh, we certainly could not have done a lot of the things that we've achieved uh, with regard to eliminating some of the al-Qaeda leaders and, and terrorists uh, over the past two years uh, with great success. 
We've also uh, been helpful, I think, in addressing some of Pakistan's concern. We've uh, come to their aid in times of humanitarian disaster in 2006, an earthquake, more recently, major floods. Um, but there, we still have not crossed that threshold where the, uh, what we have proposed as a long-term strategic relationship and all that implies, including economic development, people-to-people uh, -people programs, um, the involvement of the whole of government, if you will, not just ours, but also a significant portion of the international community, uh, apply to Pakistan's future um, in, in um, an expectation of really two, two things. One is to renounce the use of terror as an instrument of foreign policy, which most countries around the world do. And the other is to ultimately move against um, terrorist safe havens that, that exist and, as I said in my remarks, um, cause the uh, Afghan, um, the rate of progress in Afghanistan to be more difficult and take longer than it, perhaps it should. So I think um, we'll have to wait and see uh, how this plays out um, after the, all of the intelligence is analyzed and um, you know, there was a clearer picture of who knew what and when. Um, and then to see if, if um, Pakistan and the United States can get together and ba maybe re-baseline the relationship and, and go into uh, what is an absolutely strategically important relationship that will not only, uh, the, the solution to which will not only affect uh, and help Pakistan's future in the long term, but also provide for more stability in Afghanistan and uh, to the east uh, in India. They are, we're fortunate to have uh, Prime Minister Singh, uh, who has taken personal risk um, along the Pakistani-Indian border to m make sure that there's no provocation. But uh, it's a sensitive time because another attack from, from Pakistan uh, on India will, will be hard, they will be hard pressed to contain uh, a, a reaction that would greatly destabilize the region. And, um, and, and Pakistan, I think, is uh, acutely aware of that, and we've carried that message to them several times. So let's hope that, that with now that uh, the bin Laden uh, hunt has been concluded, uh, that we can build on the relationship and do the things that are absolutely important uh, um, for our collective security. So Senator Kerry, uh, there for talks with the government, was quoted as saying, we need to find a way to march forward if it's possible, and if it's not possible, there are a set of downside consequences that can be profound. He didn't elaborate on what those downside risks are. You talked about the upside, but what are the downside risks? Well, I think I just touched on one. The downside risks are that um, any other attacks emanating from the territory where the government of Pakistan could have and did not uh, move against a terrorist safe haven, um, and a successful attack is carried out in another country, whether it's Europe, or the United States, or, or India, uh, it will be very hard for any leader to resist uh, the hue and cry from the public to say, you know, why don't you do something about this? And, uh, and, and if and when that happens, uh, um, that is very much the downside uh, in terms of future stability for the region, uh, and we'll, it will, uh, we will embark then on a, on a new set of uh, completely different uh, parameters that we're working on now. So let's hope that, uh, as Senator Kerry pointed out, that the upside of things can carry the day here. Logic uh, would indicate that um, it should, and uh, I think we should continue to try to understand uh, Pakistani sensitivities and perspectives and uh, if we need to uh, come to some agreements about what happened or didn't happen 10 or 20 years ago, let's get beyond this. We're worried about what's happening today and what's going to happen tomorrow and that's what's important. Questioner asks, uh, how much were you involved in discussions in the White House about an intelligence lead in Abbottabad and what can you tell us about what you knew about that? Nothing. <laughs> now this, uh, I, I can say that, uh, uh, as, as has been pointed out by uh, members of our government, that uh, this was a long process. Uh, it started um, many years ago, the, the first um, 
real breakthrough came uh, last year, and um, uh, and we made the decision. The president made the decision to exploit and develop uh, this potential target, which turned out to be the last of the uh, you know the last the, the last of the uh, dry holes. And this wasn't a dry hole. This was uh, where he was. Um, and uh, but the effort that went into it is truly truly amazing. Um, and um, I think, as I, as I touched upon, I think one of the unintended consequences of bin Laden's uh, reign of terror, if I could use those words, uh, are the degree to which intelligence and operational forces, not only in our country, but in many, many other countries that we work with every day, have now come together to create a situation where um, we are at least uh, aware of where these movements are going. Um, whereas before we were chasing them uh, and we would react to them, we have, um, we have been quite successful in being quite proactive, uh, not only in uh, causing huge damage to the leadership structure of Al Qaeda, uh, but also uh, anticipating uh, and, and having a pretty good idea of where they're operating uh, on the planet and what their, what their intent is. Questioner asks, what do you think about the use of interrogation techniques that reportedly led to the discovery of bin Laden's hideout, and should they be banned? Well, this was a predictable consequence, I think, uh, uh, for, for both sides of the argument. Um, um, my, my, my personal view is that um, um, uh, I, I do not support uh, the, the the idea that the United States should be viewed uh, for all of the values that we stand for as a nation that condones torture. Uh, and I'm going to let the kind of the, the debate will, will go on now as to, as to what exactly was extracted and who knew what when, and I won't be involved in that. But, um, but I do think that the, um, the President's uh, decision um, in 2009 um, was, was correct. Um, and I think that uh, more will, this debate will, will continue and we'll see where it goes and I think it, it gets to the definition of what really, what is torture and, and, and what isn't. But um, more to be said about that I think as the, uh, as the dialogue unfolds. Okay. Uh, what are your thoughts about the U.S. Special Forces who carried out the mission to kill bin Laden? Or ended up killing him? Well, I'm, I'm uh, in, uh, I think we're all in, in uh, great admiration for uh, all of our young men and women in uniform, wherever they are and wherever they serve. They are wonderful examples of our society. Um, they're all volunteers. Um, and some of them um, go into special forces. Uh, each service has them. Uh, they are truly um, great uh, patriots and heroic people that uh, would not hesitate to make the ultimate sacrifice for the values and, and, our, and the causes we believe in, uh, even for other countries. So um, I, I don't have the vocabulary to, I think, uh, adequately express uh, my admiration. I've been privileged to work with them for 40 years in uniform. I admire what they do. Um, and uh, I think in this particular case, uh, it goes to show just how good they really are. And it's something we can be very thankful for. I asked you earlier about, uh, before we came down here today, about the relevance of apparently the operational involvement of bin Laden that we now know in retrospect. Could you talk about how that uh, perhaps informs us about what has been going on and what, uh, what it means about the potential for attacks in the future? Well, I think that, um, uh, that while the the degree to which, at least initially, if I read the reports correctly, that the degree to which he was involved was may have been a surprise, but I don't think it's necessarily indicative that um, there's a um, there's a major threat as a result of his involvement. He was always going to be the, the symbolic leader. We just had this image of him living in a cave and coming out uh, at times to release a video or a, a document a documentary or to make some some statement. Um, we do know that um, bin Laden uh, last year uh, had was personally involved in planning um, some so-called major attack 
um, on the European landmass. And as an example of our collaboration with our European friends and allies, we worked very hard and very long uh, to make sure that we shared whatever intelligence we had with them and they with us. And in the course of um, trying to prevent uh, that attack, uh, we're able to, each country participating was able to really actually uh, clean up uh, some bad actors uh, in different countries. Uh, and for reasons that, uh, that uh, I, I don't know, but I'm happy about, uh, that attack never, never came off. Um, and I believe that the fact that bin Laden is now no longer uh, able to, to lead, uh, he will inspire, but he won't be personally planning things. Um, the, uh, the fact is that we're probably all safer in terms of a grandiose um, event, a la 9-11. Uh, uh, there will be probably some reper repercussions at the tactical level with poorly planned but pop-up type of revenge attacks. But the, I, there's no question, I think, that um, because of the, the way in which our intelligence organizations work and our operational forces blend and our willingness to transfer information very rapidly in order to thwart these kinds of attacks, that uh, uh, it's quite possible that um, this will be a, a, a defining moment in, in the war against terror. Um, and I, I hope that it is. And uh, what you said earlier that, and I'd just like to perhaps for you elaborate on a little bit about the remarkable extent now that you see the collaboration among nations on uh, gathering intelligence that you said would not have occurred had it not been for 9-11. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, I, yes, I think that you know, it was obvious that uh, Al-Qaeda uh, <coughs> caused, uh, caused us to really reevaluate not only our own internal uh, uh, processes and the, the, the harmony that exists in the intelligence community and, and how you measure, uh, how, you, how you bring intelligence to the, to the operators and how you do that in a relatively uh, secure mode so you don't jeopardize the, uh, uh, the sources or the operation itself, um, really had a um, transformational effect, that the benefits of which that we are reaping today. Um, what goes on 24-7 around the clock uh, in this capital and in others um, is astounding. And, and, and uh, it speaks well, I think, to the, uh, the passion to defend this country and others. Um, and uh, um, the rate in which we can convert useful technology into um, helping us to uh, win this battle is, has, been, has been great, and the, the, the international community that's come together uh, to uh, make all of our borders safe is, is something that I, I'm sure Bin Laden never thought about, but it is the, it is the consequence, it is a reality, and uh, we should be thankful um, because this will apply not just against Al-Qaeda, but applies against all terrorist organizations that might have uh, similar um, designs. In that it's the 10th anniversary of 9-11 coming up, is there a danger that governments and people become complacent and that we haven't had a similarly serious attack since then? You know, I, I would, um, uh, we've, had, we've had attempts, uh, none of them have been successful. The, the one that worries me the most was the one that was the vehicle in Times Square that didn't detonate. Um, but those of us who um, know about these things have concluded that that was really a successful attack. It's just that the, at, the, at the moment of detonation, the kinetic uh, capabilities of the, of, the, of the bomb did not work. And so many lives were probably spared. That caused us to really go back and work even harder uh, to try to um, to find out what, what we could do better to um, uh, make sure that uh, no attack gets, gets that far. Um, you know, as the anniversary comes up, I think you, vigilance will, um, I can assure you that the that vigilance will be extremely high um, and we should take nothing for granted. Uh, we're still not out of this. Uh, 
And while we can take, uh, we can rejoice at this immediate outcome of the last two weeks, um, the threat is still there. It's still real. And, uh, but thank God we have dedicated people who will not be lulled uh, to being compl complacent. And, uh, and uh, knowing how the, the rhythms of, of the discussions on these issues in the White House, I can assure you that um, that's, uh, I don't think there's any chance that uh, anybody will take their pack off on this subject. So then the question's being asked about, does this change our commitment in Afghanistan that Bin Laden is gone? Uh, and I know Secretary Gates has essentially said it's too early to ask that question, but obviously the question's being asked. So uh, w right now, based on what we know, what level and pace of troop withdrawals would you recommend? Um, that knife's we, getting awfully we, we close do, to your right hand. We do, we do, we do want to finish around <laughs> 2 o'clock, right? <laughs> I, I, I actually, I, I mean, I actually really think that um, we have, uh, since the NATO summit in Portugal in December, a, a probably is a cohesive a game plan in terms of the international community. And we have to always remember that we're not the only ones in this. We're the biggest player by far, but we're not the only ones um, who are paying a price uh, for this uh, for our, our involvement in Afghanistan. Other countries are as well, and we should be grateful um, for their sacrifice and their effort. Uh, um, in in uh, December of last year at the Lisbon summit, the NATO summit, the countries agreed that we would uh, um, honor President Karzai's request that he be in full control of his country, um, security, economic, and governance by 2014. The, the road to 2014 will start this year. Uh, I don't know what the recommendation will be in terms of, you know, what, how much, how much, what our troops, how many of our troops will leave or how many allies will leave. I don't know a lot of the details except for the concept uh, that makes sense. Um, at some point, Afghans, after all these years, are going to have to um, step up to the task. We should, we the international community should continue to support them as best we can. But the decision has generally been made that by 2014, uh, this will be, the, the, this, we are all shooting to making President Karzai's desire a reality. Um, from a U.S. perspective, we have offered a long-term strategic relationship with the government of Afghanistan. Um, we'll see how that plays out. There are certain things that we would like to see happen, I'm sure. We would like to see governance and rule of law um, become more paramount in that country. We'd like to see corruption uh, decreased. And we'd like to see some economic uh, renewal. We'd like to encourage the international community, the business community, to invest um, in, in Afghanistan. And, but this will be a relatively short period of time between now and 2014 when all of these things will have to be put in place. One thing that is positive is the, the transference to Iraqi control of each province one at a time as each province uh, shows itself ready to take over security, economic, and governance responsibilities is an exciting uh, program. And it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you can see it on, on a simple map. Uh, that. Uh, I'm told that uh, effort is underway and, and uh, what the progress that we're making is encouraging just as the security uh, investment that we made uh, over a couple of years ago is now paying uh, good dividends as well. Questioner asks, what guarantee is there that when the U.S. forces withdraw from Afghanistan that the vacuum of power won't be filled by radical elements? Well, unfortunately, there, there, are, there is no, uh, no guarantee. Um, um, and uh, just as there is no guarantee that uh, Iraq, when we pull out, uh, won't chart its own path, it might not be in, in total uh, harmony with what we had in mind. Uh, we hope that's not the case. Uh, but one sure way to make sure that uh, the, the linkages between these efforts uh, goes the way we would like to see them, and that is to say to provide a better way of life and more opportunity for the people of Iraq and Afghanistan is to really uh, um, take a holistic approach to not just security but also economic 
uh, investment and development and, and also, uh, to the extent that we can, influencing the um, government and rule of law uh, reforms uh, that uh, the people of Iraq and the people of um, Afghanistan clearly want and deserve. And so uh, it, it isn't just about the security aspect of things. Uh, you have to have security um, to establish a certain level of um, capabilities elsewhere in the society, but we should never take our eye off the fact that more needs to be done than just uh, defeating um, Saddam Hussein or, or defeating the Taliban or Al-Qaeda. Um, we learned that lesson in World War II uh, with Germany, uh, in Japan. Uh, everywhere we have taken a more holistic approach to problem solving, we've done well. If I just got back from South Korea not long ago, it, and uh, you know what a great success story South Korea is, the one that all Korean War veterans should take great pride in. And that's the kind of ambition we have for uh, other countries that we're trying to help and that other countries are trying to help as well. And so let's hope that um, we can be successful, but let's also remember that we can't want this uh, any more than the people themselves want it in the long term. Well, and that's a great transition point to President Obama's speech uh, that uh, will uh, deal with all these questions. So we had a couple of questions here. Uh, essentially, what would you hope he can accomplish, and what would you advise him to include in that speech? I thought I'd given this job up. <laughs> um, well. You know, the, on the issue of, of uh, national security, it, it's clear that national security has a much broader portfolio than ever before. It includes cybersecurity, it includes economic issues, it includes things like climate, uh, it includes uh, things like energy in particular. Um, and um, uh, I think if, if, um, if I were to um, make any kind of uh, contribution um, in the future, it would be towards tackling uh, not only our deficit and, and, uh, and our economic situation, but, but critically um, our, our, secure, our uh, energy uh, portfolio and how it's managed uh, for the future. This is a truly 21st century problem that we're facing. Uh, it, it requires uh, leadership. Uh, at the highest level. Uh, I've used the analogy that uh, President Eisenhower, when he had his vision for the highway system, uh, really had a lot of opposition to the idea of building highways to nowhere in our country. And aren't we glad that, that he prevailed and gave us this fantastic uh, road system that we have today. I liken the energy problem to the highway problem of, of years ago. We need an energy highway that takes us to a destination, and that destination includes um, harnessing the technologies that are available, analyzing the portfolio, making whatever, whatever organizational structural reforms we need in our executive branch and legislative branch to, to create a really bipartisan approach to what I think is one of the most serious uh, challenges uh, that we face. The good news is, that it's doable. It really is doable. Americans know how to do this. And the American people want this. It's not a question of reacting when the price, of gallon, uh, price for a gallon of gas is $4 or $5 and then forgetting about it if it goes below $3. This is a steady state problem that will affect us. It'll affect our next generation and a generation after that. Um, it affects our balance of payments. It affects just about just about everything I can think of. So in addition to the President's many, many problems, uh, uh, I would hope that uh, the administration can find uh, the conviction and the time to turn to this particular critical problem because it's not only important domestically, but it's, impor it's an important component of how the U.S. will lead in the 21st century and the role that we will play on the global playing field on what is not only a national security issue but international security issue as well. Frankly, um, if you look at the emergence of the, if you look at the growing disparity between the, the haves and the have-not nations, uh, one way that you can bridge that gap and have convergence instead of divergence 
is for the advanced societies to help the, the, the societies that are now, the governments that are now getting to that point where they have to choose between fossil fuels and not much else. We can help them j jump that generation so that they don't damage the climate and they get to uh, cleaner, uh, more affordable energy uh, sources in the future and a, more, a, a greater variety of energy sources. The United States can, can lead in that effort and can, and while we can't do it by ourselves, we can uh, significantly affect the, the global playing field with regard to energy in the 21st century, which is as important as anything else that I, I think uh, that the President will have to take on uh, in his uh, remaining years in office. Mm -hmm. So uh, among the areas that one might hope there'd be bipartisan agreement in the Congress has to do with funding the operations of the government. Uh, with the budgetary pressures that are facing uh, the nation now, uh, it seems as if defense spending uh, may have to uh, be reduced. Uh, where do you see uh, perhaps the most rational solutions there? Well, I think Secretary Gates has, has just been uh, superb in anticipating this reality uh, as, recent, as early as two years ago. Um, he started talking about uh, the need to find economies of scale within the Defense Department uh, and set about to do that. Um, I think that um, what we're really talking about here is uh, a reevaluation of uh, kind of roles and missions in the sense that um, the likelihood of a major uh, peer, peer rival level uh, 20th century type conflict are probably pretty remote. Um, but the likelihood of uh, being able to, of being, of being asked to help shape the environment um, in different parts of the world um, are probably pretty high. And, but it's going to take a, a different organizational construct in terms of the types of forces that are used. And by the way, I think those forces will have to be used in conjunction with a whole of government approach depending on what it is we're trying to change or affect. Um, I think um, we have left the 20th century, which was, in terms of um, in terms of warfare, a reactive type of century. NATO is a react was a reactive organization. I don't think we have the luxury of, of reacting and waiting uh, a long time to react to things that we know are going to happen. And if you know it's going to happen, then perhaps you can affect the outcome by engaging earlier and with the right prescription, the right amount of aid, the right amount of uh, training, the right amount of uh, uh, economic incentives, um, and a much closer working relationship between the public and private sector, uh, I think is going to help us a great deal and will uh, continue to reinforce the, I think the destiny that all Americans want is that in 20 or 30 years, uh, we want to be a nation of, of, that is respected and admired and influential in the globe. Now, it's going to be a different century, uh, and therefore our response to different challenges is going to have to be different, and we're going to have to organize ourselves to, to be more rapid, to be more agile, uh, and it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be doing things the way we did them in the 20th century, and that will apply to the Defense Department. And I think that um, Secretary Gates and the, uh, the Joint Chiefs uh, fully understand that. We've been through economic uh, hard times, um, and in those times, the services did some of their better thinking. Um, you don't tend to, tend to think too much if the, the money trough is completely on open all the time, and you tend to just take it and, and use it. But when, it's, when, when it tightens a little bit, uh, that's when you, you really start thinking, okay, what do we really need here? What is it that we're trying to do? How do we organize ourselves? Uh, and how do, we, how do we get through this period um, in, a, in a useful way? And I think, I think what Secretary Gates has achieved is, uh, and, and the President has supported his, uh, his uh, actions, has been to start that process so that it's not a surprise. Mm -hmm. I ask you to be somewhat uh, succinct in this next question just because we're almost running out of time, but how do you feel like we're doing with Libya right now? Well, I, I think that's an open question, and uh, I, we all understand, um, you know, how we got in there. The, the President made a decision to 
uh, forestall a humanitarian catastrophe. Uh, and largely succeeded in doing that. But putting your foot in, into Libya translated into the United Nations and NATO reacting relatively quickly for two organizations that are around, usually criticized for being too, too late, too little, too late, and too slow. Um, and now it is a NATO operation. It's a NATO operation with a limited mandate uh, to protect the population. Um, and as I said in my remarks, um, I think it's still too early to tell, but it, it looks like um, Gaddafi is, uh, you know, at least has the wherewithal to you know, ride this out for a, a little bit longer. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the, the, the judgment will be in the not too distant future, if uh, Gaddafi still remains at the uh, helm of his country, that uh, despite that the mandate didn't, sp didn't ask for any kind of support to an overthrow, uh, but to support um, the, uh, the protection of innocent people, um, they will be judged against whether Gaddafi uh, s stays in office. That's just, the, that's just reality. It may not be fair. But I do think it's a little bit too early yet uh, to, to see how this is going to play out. Uh, we're almost out of time, uh, but before we ask the last question, a couple of housekeeping matters to take care of. I'd like to remind you all about some upcoming luncheon speakers. On May 20th, Richard Trumka, president of AFL-CIO, will be our guest. And then May 26th, Juan Williams, a political commentator and Fox News contributor, uh, will appear, uh, in a sense, to reply to Vivian Schiller's speech from earlier in the year. Uh, when she held the job as head of NPR about his firing, and she addressed uh, those issues then. Gary Sinise, uh, on down the road, an Oscar-nominated actor, will announce the formation of the Gary Sinise Foundation. It's a charity dedicated to raising funds for charities supporting the military. I'd also like to remind you that on June 11th, the National Press Club hosts its 14th annual Beat the Deadline 5K race with honorary marshals Tony Horton of P90X and Suzanne Malveau of CNN. Now, secondly, I would like to go through the tradition here of uh, presenting our guest with the highly coveted NPC mug, and I might note that it is not a, as handy a weapon as the steak knife that we'll be happy to present to you as well, but uh, we do appreciate very that very much, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. My last question is about movies. What is your favorite film about war? Um, I have two. Uh, the first one is From Here to Eternity, um, and the second one is uh, Sands of Iwo Jima. Good choice. And what I particularly like about the Sands of Iwo Jima was uh, John Wayne and his role as Sergeant Stryker. When he uh, was lecturing one of his Marines who did something wrong, and he said something that I've always used. Uh, since I first, uh, since I heard it, and he said, "Life is tough, but it's tougher if you're stupid." <laughs> That's good. That's great stuff. How about a round of applause for our speaker today? Thank you. To all of you for coming today and also to General Jones, and I'd like to thank National Press Club staff, including our library and broadcast center, for helping to organize today's event. And finally, a reminder that you can find more information about the National Press Club on our website, and if you'd like a copy of today's program, you can check it out at www.press.org. Thank you, and we're adjourned. That was great. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Since leaving government and military service, our guest speaker has turned his focus to launching a consulting company, Jones Group International, and there he is confronting 21st century, 21st century national security issues to improve U.S. economic competitiveness and to develop a comprehensive energy strategy. Of course, his areas of expertise are relevant to affairs of life and death, the most critical decisions that rise to the highest levels of government. And that's why we're so pleased to have him as our guest speaker today. Please give a warm National Press Club welcome to General James Jones. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. And, and uh, it's a great honor to be here. And I, I want to compliment you on your choice of weapons. Uh, <laughs> 
this is uh, very impressive. And Marines like knives, and so depending on how aggressive the questions get, uh, <laughs> be forewarned. Uh, we are we are defending the podium. I uh, I am uh, thrilled to be here. Uh, I, uh, and I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, and I want to especially thank Pat Milton for, for her hard work in uh, bringing this. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Mark Hamrick. I'm a broadcast journalist for the Associated Press. I'm the 104th president of the National Press Club. We are the world's leading organization for journalists, committed to our profession's future through our programming, events such as this, while also working to foster a free press around the world. For more information about the National Press Club, please visit our website at www.press.org. To donate to programs offered to the public through our Eric Friedheim National Journalism Library, you can find information on the website there as well. So on behalf of our members worldwide, I'd like to welcome our speaker and those of our, you attending today's event. Our head table includes working journalists as well as guests of the speaker, uh, working journalists who are club members. If you hear applause in our audience, we'd like to note that members of the general public are attending here today, so it's not necessarily evidence of a lack of journalistic objectivity. I'd also like to welcome our C-SPAN and public radio audiences. Our luncheons are also featured on our member-produced weekly podcast from the National Press Club, available through iTunes. You can also follow the action on Twitter using the hashtag, uh, using the, uh, using the uh, search term hashtag uh, NPC lunch. After our guest speech concludes, we'll have a Q&A, and I'll ask as many questions as time permits. And now it's time to introduce our head table guests. I'd ask each of you here to please stand up briefly as your name is announced. So from your right, Mark Ramondi with Harris Corporation, NPC member, director of communications there. John Fales, a columnist with the Washington Times. Myron Belkind is our club secretary, and he is adjunct uh, professor with George Washington University, former Associated Press Bureau Chief in London, Tokyo, and New Delhi. Lee Perryman with the Associated Press. He is Director of Broadcast Technology. <coughs> Mrs. Diane Jones, wife of General James Jones, our guest speaker today. Now uh, moving over the podium, Melissa Charbonneau with Newshook Media, and she is the awesome chair of our speakers committee. Skip over the speaker for a moment. Pat Milton, investigative producer with CBS News, and uh, she's a new member of the Speakers Committee. This is her first event today, and she organized today's event. Pat, thank you very much. Buzz Hefty is vice president of Van Skoyak Associates, and he is a guest of the speaker. Andrea Stone, senior national correspondent with the Huffington Post. John Donnelly. Senior writer with Congressional Quarterly covering defense and foreign policy issues, and he is vice chair of our Board of Governors. And Shannon O'Reilly, a new member of the National Press Club. She is with the Center for a New American Security. Please give them a round of applause. Our guest speaker today is a man who has spent his life facing the most critical challenges one can imagine and handling them with grace and a steady hand. Those who know him point to his intelligence, his integrity, his calmness, his confidence, and believe it or not, his sense of humor. At six foot four, he played basketball for the Georgetown Hoyas in college and probably could have pursued a sports career. But he chose to follow in the footsteps of his father and his uncle and join the Marine Corps and he had big shoes to fill. His father retired as a major, and in World War II, he was the first commander of Marine Corps Force Reconnaissance, that's the Marine version of Navy SEALs. All three, father, son, and uncle, ended up serving in Vietnam at the same time in the late 1960s. After the war, he was faced with a crucial decision. If he was going to have a career in the military, he would have to follow orders to Japan. And that meant leaving his wife and four children, under the age of six, behind for more than a year. That would be a huge burden for the family, but like most decisions in his life, he had married well too. His wife, Diane, took on that responsibility, and he would be forever grateful, and so is the nation. Not everybody who works hard and pursues his dream ends up as Commandant of the U.S. Marine Corps, and then Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, and then is chosen to be the U.S. National 
security advisor to the President of the United States, President Barack Obama, but there is only one General James Jones. General Jones has served his country selflessly and with distinction, and unknown to most people, General Jones many times used to ride his bicycle to work at the White House. That meant a pre-dawn 14-mile long trip from his suburban Washington home, depending on the route chosen that day by his security detail. He speaks fluent French. He's a big fan of country music star Toby Keith. In fact, he had Keith perform for the Marines in Washington, where he urged him for the first time to sing his now famous hit, Angry American. 